Hello everybody, uh, I have been absent from YouTube for about a month. I was taking this time to create a series of presentations and uh, I'm going to be giving them over the next few weeks, probably a presentation every couple of weeks. And if you like the content, uh, please uh, give a thumbs up and subscribe. Today I wanted to talk about an especially important question that I come across all the time and perhaps I did not treat it well before. I have learned a lot from my patients over the last seven years and the question is, is a high fat diet safe in obese people? We are recommending a low carb diet by design that's a high fat diet. Is there something called lipotoxicity? The paradigm that I'm trying to explore is, is this harmful? So here is an obese individual. Usually these individuals are hyperinsulinemic. They have high insulin levels. They have slight glucose intolerance. They have slightly elevated levels of triglycerides and some people have higher levels depending on the severity of insulin resistance. And to these individuals, we are recommending, hey, and these patients come and ask me, can I drink a cup of coffee that is doused with MCT oil and fat so that I can stave off hunger. Can I eat a high fat meat? I have been recommending people before that buy the fattiest cut of cuts of meat. Was that a right recommendation? We are cooking food with large amounts of olive oil. We are adding butter to our food. Is that the right thing to do? This is an image of the pancreas. Out here on the right is a normal pancreas that has insulin producing beta cells in red and glucagon producing alpha cells in green. The reason I put this slide up is to show to you that an obese individual who is insulin resistant has large amounts of increase in their insulin manufacturing machinery. That is, they have large number of beta cells, which is they are hypertrophied. They are larger and more in number. And if you look at the amount of insulin that an obese individual makes, and here are people who are morbidly obese, the amount of insulin is by an order of magnitude higher or greater than people who are lean in a 24 hour period. So obese individuals are making a lot of insulin. Unfortunately, this insulin down regulates insulin receptor. So there is insulin and it functions through the insulin receptor, which carries out the actions of insulin. One of the functions of insulin is to pack the fat that you have eaten into the fat cells. So here are chylomicrons. These are fat-filled globules from absorption of fat through the food. They are packaged into a lipoprotein called chylomicron. And the job of insulin is to transfer the fat from this into the fat cells under the control of an enzyme that it elaborates at the level of fat cells called lipoprotein lipase. The body does not like to keep the levels of fat high in the bloodstream. That is not good for the body. So a normal individual clears the fat from the bloodstream very rapidly after they have eaten. That brings up to the question of what is healthy adipose tissue? What is healthy fat tissue? Healthy fat tissue has small and large fat cells. These small fat cells are capable of taking in more fat from the fat that you eat. They have high levels of a hormone called adiponectin. I have several young women who are not obese who eat less, who practice intermittent fasting, who are physically active, and in them the adiponectin levels are very high, over 20. Adiponectin levels 
curtail the release of fat from the fat cells only to the amount that is necessary. Normal fat cells are not inflamed. So these fat cells are releasing fatty acids into the bloodstream. These fatty acids are going through beta oxidation. That means they're going through burning in the muscles to create energy, in the heart to create energy. In the liver, they're getting converted to ketones so that we can supply brain with fuel, with food, when we are not eating. And what is not consumed is repackaged into a molecule called VLDL. Now that's a type of a cholesterol molecule that is fat filled. And this VLDL is rapidly emptied of its fat content because the fat cells are healthy. They take the fat back that is not used. And the VLDL can also give fat back to the muscles for reutilization. What is unhealthy adipose tissue? Unhealthy adipose tissue are fat cells that are overstuffed they are inflamed, they have low adiponectin levels, and these fat cells cannot contain the amount of fat in them, so they release a lot more fatty acids. Unfortunately, these fatty acids, because of insulin resistance, do not undergo beta oxidation. In other words, they are not used. These fat cells now get deposited or this fat, fatty acid gets deposited in the muscles, in the heart, in the liver. Even though the liver is taking up a lot of fat, it cannot convert it, them to ketones because the insulin levels are high. So it re-exports the fat as VLDL. Now this is the triglycerides that the doctor measures in you when you go in. So when they're saying the triglycerides are high, in a sense, your VLDL is high. But the VLDL is incapable of giving the fat back to the fat cells because they are overstuffed. So fat from here is recycled back and it creates what is called visceral adiposity, visceral fat. That means fat buildup in your pancreas fat build up in your liver, fat build up in your internal organs. And this leads to dysfunction. So when you're talking about a high fat diet in an obese individual, the way you should frame the argument is that if you cannot immediately pack the fat into the fat cells or cannot immediately burn it, don't eat it because fat in, left in the bloodstream causes visceral obesity, which means there is fat deposition in our internal organs, such as the pancreas, the liver, the heart, and this damages our health. The fat also gets converted to a certain lipotoxic fat, in other words, a toxic fat called ceramide, and this ceramide, when it gets into the pancreas, causes cell death, fat-induced cell death. This was described well in a my study by Dr. Roger Unger. Dr. Roger Unger is a fellow Texan. He's done some seminal work and we have learned a lot from him. In fact, I'm going to dedicate a YouTube talk to his work and to recognize his contributions. In this uh, study, Dr. Unger took mice, normal mice, and found that the amount of fat in their pancreas is normal, as is the amount of sugar in their bloodstream. Now he compared them to a group of mice that make a lot of insulin and they become obese. These are called DBDB mice. And when he looked at the fat content of their pancreas, for the first eight weeks of life, the fat content was slightly higher compared to the control animals. Their blood sugar levels were all, also a little higher, but at about eight weeks of life, the fat content in the pancreas went up dramatically. And as it did, so did the blood sugars. The blood sugars also increased and these animals rapidly became diabetic. 
Now, when he examined their pancreas, what he found is that the lean animal had normal mitochondria. These are energy producing uh, organelles inside our cells. These are the engines of our cells. If they're normal, our cell is healthy. These cells also had insulin stored in granules. So insulin granules were normal. Whereas in the DBDB mouse that had a lot of fat accumulation, we could see that the mitochondria were almost unrecognizable. They were dying. The insulin granules were not as mature. They were fewer in number. Is there a human correlate of the study? His colleague Lydia Sheshepank has done human studies in which she examined the amount of fat in the pancreas through imaging techniques. And in a normal person who is insulin sensitive and whom insulin is working well, the amount of fat in the pancreas was low. As the person became hyperinsulinemic and obese, the pancreatic fat content went up. It went up even greater as this person started having insulin resistance that led to impaired glucose tolerance. In other words, they could not maintain normal sugar levels anymore. And when they became type 2 diabetics, their pancreatic fat content was even higher. So there is human evidence that as the visceral fat increases, your insulin resistance gets worse. What is ceramide? Now ceramide is a type of fat that is produced by condensing breakdown products of protein with a fatty acid. So fat cells are releasing this fatty acid. Serine is a breakdown product of protein. And the fatty acids, when they are inflamed, overstuffed, and when they have low adiponectin levels, they elaborate a certain hormone called SPT, serine palmitoyl transferase. This hormone takes serine and fatty acids and through a series of chemical reactions makes ceramide. Ceramide is toxic for us. Ceramide gets deposited in the liver, in the muscles, and in the heart, and it prevents insulin action. It's important to recognize that insulin is a hormone and it causes its action through an insulin receptor. As insulin sits on the insulin receptor, it helps the body remove the sugar from the bloodstream, the sugar levels that are going up dramatically as a person eats. It deposits fat in the fat cells. This ceramide reduces insulin signaling, as I will show in the uh, next slide. But also, the ceramide gets into the pancreas. When it gets into the pancreas, it destroys the beta cells. Out here is a beta cell that's making insulin, and its nucleus is almost being destroyed in this picture. So this is what is called lipotoxicity. Lipotoxicity, fat-induced toxicity as a result of ceramide. So making ceramides redundant, ceramides are derived from breakdown products of protein and fat meta metabolism they make a part of the cell membrane and the mitochondrial membrane. They're also signaling molecules. Their production and removal, that is the flux, is exquisitely controlled. It is controlled very in a fine-tuned way in our body. And overproduction of these compounds is as a result of inflammation. And overproduction of ceramide leads to beta cell death as well as insulin resistance. And the subsequent two slides show that. So these are fatty acids. They are higher in bloodstream in an obese individual who is insulin resistant. These fatty acids activate certain receptors 
that are responsible for recognizing foreign material, TLR. When this receptor is activated, a series of chemical reactions happen inside the cell that increases the production of enzymes. In other words, the DNA now is reprogrammed to make an enzyme called SPT, serine, serine palmitoyl transferase, that takes fatty acids in serine and converts it into ceramide. This compound destroys the mitochondria. The mitochondrial membrane is messed up. The mitochondria cannot burn fuel. It alters the protein manufacturing machinery of the body. It creates certain mediators that blocks insulin signaling. Like we mentioned, insulin sits on the insulin receptor and it does a series of beneficial actions. One of the actions that it does is that it removes sugar from circulation. Why is that important? If you look at the total amount of sugar in our bloodstream, we have five liters of blood, you would be surprised to know that the total amount of blood sugar is only about one teaspoon, about five grams in five liters. An average American in the course of a meal can eat about 250 to 300 grams of carbohydrates. That's equivalent to approximately 60 teaspoons of sugar. The body controls the amount of glucose in our bloodstream quite finely. And the way it does that is through insulin and insulin receptor signaling. Ceramides are disrupting that. They are disrupting insulin receptor signaling and so you are not able to control the amount of sugar in your bloodstream when it goes up. Insulin also helps our body make new protein. Insulin helps pack the fat into the fat cells. So in people who have high ceramide, fat is left in the bloodstream that causes visceral obesity. In addition, ceramide through a series of inflammation inducing agents elaborates inflammation agents such as interleukin-1. So ceramide is lipotoxic. It is lipotoxic to the brain. It affects insulin signaling in the brain, in the muscles, in the fatty tissue. It destroys the insulin-making manufacturing machinery in the pancreas. It destroys our kidney cells. It affects insulin signaling in the liver and in the heart. Now, young people that I have seen, young women especially, have high levels of adiponectin. Adiponectin is induced with fasting, with exercise. When you empty your fat cells, the adiponectin levels go up. That means that the fat cells are healthy and happy. High adiponectin levels activate certain enzymes called ceramidases that breaks down ceramide into breakdown products. And perhaps this is the way through which fasting, exercise, help improve the health of our fat cells. So we are returning to the question that we started out with. And the question is, is that should an obese individual be on a high fat diet? An obese individual is hyperinsulinemic. They have insulin resistance, consequently they have high glucagon levels. The interaction between insulin and glucagon is going to be the subject of another talk that is going to come up. They have elevated levels of sugar, they have high triglycerides as VLDL, they have high fatty acids, they have low adiponectin levels. They have high levels of CRP and marker of inflammation. Can I recommend to these people to have bulletproof coffee that is doused with MCT and butter, to make food with large amounts of olive oil and to eat fatty meat? The answer to that should be no. The answer to that should be no. 
So how would you treat them? The way you would treat them is that you give them techniques to empty their fat cells, to improve satiety, to reduce inflammation, to improve their cholesterol quality. I have several talks on cholesterol and cholesterol quality in statins. To make insulin work better. So in other words, reduce insulin resistance. Now I'm part of an organization called IDM and the fasting method. And my leaders, the leaders of my organization, actually came up with the best paradigm to improve our health a long time ago. And that is intermittent and long-term fasting. So based on their blood work and based on individualizing a certain person's recommendation, I may have to say, hey, you need to do intermittent or long-term fasting or both. I have to train them on how to improve their satiety. In other words, teach them techniques of improving satiety. I also have to teach them how caffeine and exercise can be used in a fasted state. And that's the subject of another YouTube video that I'm going to come out with. So that insulin levels are reduced and insulin signaling is improved. So I thought these short videos are better and more useful and I can take a small area of the low carb field and dissect it so that it is palatable and it brings it down to the level of the consumer. Thank you.